I'm glad you're here as we're continuing on with this series talking about the path that you choose. And, and today as we start our time together, I want to share a little bit, a little story from Melinda and, and, and mine, our, our honeymoon that we went on, something that happened to us uh, while we were there. We, we went to this place called Anaconda, Montana. Okay, and, and it was this beautiful resort up in the hills and everything, and, and uh, to spend the week there. When we got there, you know, we're reading through the brochures of the things that you could do while you're there and, and all the different stuff that was going on. And one of the things that they had was you could do a breakfast ride, that they called it, where you would go and that, and they would take you out on horseback and take you out into the, this beautiful valley, and, and, and you'd go there in this beautiful scenery and serve your breakfast. And we thought that'd be neat and romantic, you know. And so we signed up, and when we went there that next morning at the time we were supposed to be there, there was nobody there. We couldn't find anybody in any of the stable, none of the place, you know, and, and stuff. So we went back later on that day. We called them, and there was a big mix-up. We were the only ones that signed up for it, and, and they felt really bad. So they said, can you come back this afternoon, and we'll, we'll just let you go out on a free ride all by yourself and, and, and that kind of stuff and not charge you for any of it. So we were like, cool. So we went back that afternoon, and, and the guy, the hand that was there, was talking to us and, and wanted to know if we had experience. And Melinda was raised around horses and ridden them and stuff like that, and and stuff and so he put her on a horse called Rambo and stuck her out in in the corral and and watched her ride to make sure she could handle the horse and knew what she was doing and stuff like that and I told him his own this will only be my second time ever being on a horse so he stuck me on a horse called Clyde and that <coughs> and you know you laugh now he stuck me on a horse named Clyde and he said Clyde is a great trail horse wherever Rambo goes Clyde will faithfully follow and that so he put me out there also and had me do some things and show me some things how to guide him around and 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 he says all right this is what you're going to do you're going to go down this gravel road here for about a mile and then you'll see a clear sign to your left where the path will go off on a trail these are trail horses they put them in the direction they'll know where to go you put them on that and they will take you around the path through the mountain about a, you know, about a two-hour ride and just go and enjoy yourself. So we thought, great, and we headed down the gravel road and about three-fourths of the way down and stuff, we're going, there's this guy working on his house and he decides to hit this drill, or not drill, excuse me, the saw cutting this piece of wood. And I don't know why, for some reason, Rambo was just fine with the sound. Something about that sound Clyde did not like. And Clyde decided to stand up on his hind two legs to let the gentleman know he didn't like the sound. So I hugged, and Clyde and I became BFFs before BFFs were even invented. I hugged his neck and hang on, you know, for dear life and stuff. He dropped down, and he dropped back up again. And finally, the guy saw what was happening, you know, and he stopped, and he waved like, oh, hey, I'm sorry. Now, Melinda in front, she has no idea. She's like, oh, hi, <laughs> you know, like, oh, the people are so friendly here, you know, and, and we went on our way, found the path, and we're going for about another half hour, and as we're on this, this, this trail, this path, we look down, and we see this other windy path that goes down to this beautiful stream that was down there. Melinda turned around, she says, hey, why don't we take the horses down there and get a picture of us with the horses down by the stream, and, and here's, here's us down by that stream. Here's a picture of us, okay? Isn't that so sweet? Uh, haven't changed a bit, have we? <laughs> you know, there, there Melinda is with Rambo. There I am with Clyde. The stream's off. You can't quite see it in that picture. So, But anyhow, we took this picture. We got back on our horses. I got on Clyde. Clyde starts to go back up on this windy path, and he stops waiting for Rambo. And I look down, and there's Melinda and Rambo in an argument. Rambo's like, uh-uh. I, you stopped the direction I was going. I want to go back the way I came. I want to go home. And they're in this argument so severe and bad, I'm thinking to myself, who did I marry? <laughs> Watching her deal with this horse and smack this horse. I'd never seen anybody punch a horse, you know, before and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, happy wife, happy life, here we go, and all this other kind of stuff. And finally she says, fine and she kicks him in the side and says you want to go up to the side of the mountain let's go and he flies by Clyde and I and just then you ever have those moments where certain things pop back into your mind in a second I remembered what the ranch hand said Clyde is an excellent trail horse he will follow Rambo wherever he goes sure enough he shoots by and there goes Clyde I'm going to <laughs> Once again, we became BFFs is in, in close, and we get to the top and stuff like that. And my loving wife, who I had just married, we'd only been married for a few days now at this particular point, you know, she just looks at me and is busting a gut laughing, thinking it's the greatest thing she'd ever seen. So we get going a little bit further, you know, on the trail. Things are going pretty uneventful the rest of the hour and a half. But we come to this clearing. Here's another picture. 
that you could see with it there. We're at this clearing, and you can see in mine, if you see way down there, there's, there's kind of the home and off to the right of that home, and that is where the barn and everything we want to go. Now, you see my horse, Clyde, looking in a direction that he's not supposed to be looking and that, and as we take these pictures, they start to speed up, and we're not telling them to speed up, and Melinda says, you got to pull back hard because they want to get, they know where they're at. They want to get to that barn. They want to get to their food and water and get us off their backs. That's all they're concerned about, and if Clyde would have continued in the direction he was going, it was not a good direction to be going, and necessarily for him, but even more so for me, especially going downhill at that speed with it and stuff like that, and so we had to, you know, get him on the trail to the left there, the road to the left, and it took a while, and it took a fight, but we got him to where we needed to go, and with much effort, we got him back, you know, in, in, into where they needed to be, and as I was getting off, the guy was helping me off the horse, I said, hey, you need to rename this. This is not Clyde, this is Demon, all right? It is not Clyde, it's Demon straight out of the pits, my friend, and stuff, and I tell you that story as we're starting our time together here, because I think there's so many times we're just like Clyde and Rambo. We're just like these horses and that because given their nature, just like almost any animal, they will not choose necessarily the right path. They want to choose the path to get what they want. It doesn't matter the consequences. It doesn't matter, you know, what it's going to do for them. It might put them in a situation that could harm them. They just want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And that's what I mean. In a lot of ways, we're like that. It didn't matter that they could harm me on that horse and stuff like it care less you know about me and my life and who I was and sometimes we're that way in the past we choose we don't think as we talked about a couple weeks ago the ripples how far go out and not only do the paths that we choose we hurt ourselves or could hurt ourselves or could be wrong it can be others that are with us we just do it we're more subtle about our rebellion you see, here's what we do sometimes. You know, we, we come to that fork in the road where the path splits and we have to make a decision. You know, so we start to weigh our options. And then we choose the path, the direction that, well, feels best to us. You know, the path that, that, that the, the path may not be that we choose may not be the best path for us. So soon after we choose that path, what we start to do is we start to put our minds to work to figure out w reasons or to say what we say to justify why we're going down this path that maybe isn't the best path for us in our life, whatever that is, financially, relationally, whatever. I mean, we all do this. Ten fingers pointed here. We've done this at different ways and times. I mean, think about this. Have you ever known anybody, or maybe you've done this, you know, you got this car and you're thinking, man, this crazy thing is a gas guzzler. With the prices of gas and everything, I can't afford to drive this gas guzzler. I need to trade it in on something more efficient, more economical. So you trade it in and drop twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars on a loan on this more efficient model of a car. And you know, as you drive your more new efficient model, you could drive it for thirty-five years, and the difference in gas consumption would still not add up to the twenty to twenty-five thousand you went in debt for. You understand what I'm saying? Or our phones, you know, these cell phones, you know. Hey, you, ever, you ever find yourself it's like, man, my cell phone, you know, it's not, it's not holding charge all day long. I have to plug it in maybe for a half hour to an hour to get the battery back up. You don't understand my lifestyle. You know, I can't be connected to a wall for that amount of time. I got to get a new phone, you know. And so we justify going and dropping 600 to 1,000, depending on the phone that you have, instead of 60 to 100 for a new battery. I mean, we all do decisions like that. And then we find ourselves asking the question or hear ourselves asking the question, how in the world did I end up where I'm at? How in the world did I end up on this path? Why are these things happening to me? Great questions. I've asked that of myself sometimes. I hear people ask that all the time. And I think Andy Stanley has a great answer to that question. In one of his books, Andy Stanley, he said this, our problem, our problem rarely stems from a lack of information or insight. It's something else, something we don't outgrow, something that another academic agree, a degree won't resolve. Our problem stems from the fact that we are not on a truth quest. That is, we don't wake up every morning with a burning desire to know what's true, what's right, what's honorable. We are on a happiness quest. That is, we want to be as in feeling, we want to feel or be happy. And our quest for happiness often trumps our appreciation for and pursuit of what's true. So that question, why am I on this path? How did I get on this path? Why do we find ourselves on the wrong path? Andy Stanley says for these two reasons. Our heart is on a happiness quest, not a truth quest. 
or our heart chooses the happy now rather than the happy later path. And if you stop and think about it, isn't that true? I mean, I know that could be frustrating to hear those things. I know it can almost, you can almost take exception when you hear those kinds of things. It almost seems like it's judgmental. But if we put the brakes on and we stop and we get honest and evaluate our life, like I'm always asking you to do, don't we find it? I'm not saying all the time, but don't we find ourselves many times doing that? I heard this example about this at a conference a while back. The speaker, he said, I'm going to put myself on the chopping block. And he said, I want to, I want to, speak specifically to you coffee drinkers, he said. He goes, what is it all about? He said, my coffee choice costs me about four bucks a day. That's ridiculous, he said. You know, he said, some people have even told me that's inexcusable in light of the needs of the world. He says, because that's $80 a month as long as I don't buy that coffee on weekends at this store that will go unnameable, or I only buy one cup a day. 80 bucks a month, he says, I could sponsor two kids from Compassion International for what I spend on this coffee. He says, what is wrong with me? He said, well, I'm on a happiness quest, and soy lattes contribute to my happiness, so I'm willing to do that. That's the illustration of, of what you know, Andy was saying in those points of, of what we struggle with each and every day. And as smart as we are and as aware as we are that life is connected and the decisions today shape the experiences of tomorrow, many times we don't wake up in the morning in search of truth, insight, and enlightenment. We get up and we want to do the things that what? going to make me happy, you know? We're all at different times at different points for different reasons. We find ourselves on this happiness quest. And it's not necessarily wrong all the time. There can be things that make us happy that can be good. Like, again, Melinda, she, she loves to go biking. You know, she loves to go out and, you know, she'll bike three, four, five, six miles. You know, that, that makes her happy. But that's a good thing because biking gives her what? Exercise. It helps keep her healthy and gives her exercise. So something that she likes that makes her happy is also something that blesses her and her health. That's where it works. But in the same breath, she will also tell you that chocolate makes her happy <laughs> and probably more happy than riding a bike. And if she decided to pursue that path every day, that wouldn't be a good thing. And it's at these forks of the road that we come, and, and almost every decision is a fork in the road, when happiness points us in one direction, while wisdom and truth and integrity and common sense points us in another, that's when really smart people start doing stupid things. That's when the happiness quest becomes dangerous, you know, in our life. So is this making sense? Two weeks ago, two weeks ago when we started this series, we said that there was this unbreakable principle that's simply this. Your direction determines your destination. Whatever direction you're headed is going to determine where you end up. And last week we talked about prudent people versus simple people. We want to make sure we're prudent people because Solomon taught us that prudent people see danger and take refuge and make changes while simple people keep going and they end up paying the penalty. And he ended up paying the penalty. And he addressed that issue as, long as, as well as the issue we're talking about here today, this quest. Because it's amazing. People 3,000 years ago still struggle with the same things that we're struggling with today. And we're going to look, if you want to turn, and, and then your devices, or if you have a Bible, want to turn there, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 3, a very popular verse. I'm sure you've heard at least Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 quoted. It's on plaques a, a lot of different times. But we're going to look at Proverbs 3, um, uh, excuse me, 5 to 12, and we're going to take a look at, maybe you haven't realized how this proverb, the wisdom that's there, that actually helps bless us in understanding the path that we're supposed to be on, the direction we're supposed to be headed, and how to stay there. In Proverbs 3, 5, starting there, it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Heard this before? Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. So according to Solomon, God will make your path straight if you will do these three things. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean, lean not on your own understanding, and acknowledge him in all your ways. Trust, lean, and acknowledge. 
The starting place for a straight path is just what it says on all of our American money. In God we trust, which is kind of somewhat ironic because in my experience, money is often the last thing that most Americans want to trust God with, is it not? But the, what we said there at the beginning of the verse, trust in the Lord with all your heart, in all your heart. The answer to choosing, you know, the right path is to choose God, to trust God, to go where he asks you to go, to do what he asks you to do every day. And not a one-time thing, it's a path. Place all your confidence, all your faith, all your hope, all your plans. But the challenge is to lean on, you know, to not lean on what your heart says is right. You know, not on what your heart wants to do. See, how many of you have ever heard said, and maybe you said it yourself, I know I've said this, you know, earlier on in my life and, and stuff like that. You ever hear somebody say this? Just go with what your heart is telling you. Follow your heart. I understand that advice that's being given, but sometimes I don't think we realize that that can be some of the most dangerous advice to give because we forget what Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah said about the heart in Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Now, what does that mean? The heart is deceitful above all things. It simply means that sometimes our heart will and can and does lie to us. You see, almost every time we want to do something that feels good short-term, that we intuitively know is not good for us long term, our hearts come up with this reason to do what we want to do rather than the thing that's best for us to do over the long term. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things. So Solomon says, when you find yourself at that fork in the road, when you find yourself having to make that decision, don't trust your heart. Trust God. Don't lean on your own understanding. Lean on God. Don't acknowledge your motivations, your intentions, your ambitions. Acknowledge God's. And if you do this, he will make your path straight. It's exactly what Christ was trying to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount when he said in, in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Acknowledge God, acknowledge his ways, and he'll make your paths straight. See, let me ask, has there ever been a time when you acknowledge God in all your ways? Well, yeah, Dave, I gave my life to him. I surrendered my life to him. And that's great if you have, you know. Many people have trusted him for their salvation, which is kind of like inviting God into your living room. Here, Lord, come into my life. Here, God, come into my house. We let him come into the living room. We bring him in. But that's as far as he gets. That's as far as he gets. Have you let him into your bedroom where your private thoughts are? Have you, have you let him in on your computer where all your access to the world is? Have you let him take a peek in those closets where you keep all those secrets tucked away? Seek first the kingdom of God and he'll take care of the rest. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll steer your ship in the right direction, your car in the right path, your life in the right places, and that when it comes to what you need to be doing in life. See, I want to ask a, a, another question here, and in, in just where you're thinking to be praying and allow God's Spirit to kind of seek. It, it, it's a tough question sometimes, and that, but it's a great question for you to take a look at in your life. What path are you on that you know you shouldn't be? but you choose to be on it because you wanted something other than to acknowledge God's ways. Let me ask that again. What path are you on right now in your life that you shouldn't be on? You know very well you shouldn't be on, but you're choosing to be on it because you wanted something other to, than to acknowledge God's way. I'm on this path and we've done everything that we've said about it here. You know, And, and on one level, I understand this question we never want anybody to ask because it reveals so much about us if we get honest. But on the other hand, it's a question we do want to ask and should ask because this is the area we most need help in. And when we get honest about this question and we open up, and, and that this is what actually allows us to do what we talk about here all the time, allowing people to come in because we realize we need help. And we start doing life together, turning to people, seeking together, praying together, studying together in our life. So what is it you haven't been trusting God with with all of your heart? Where is it at least before now you haven't acknowledged God in all your ways? Trust in the Lord. And Solomon continues on. Like he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And that. So after telling us how to get this path straight and the path that we need to be on, he says, look it, there's three action steps that you need to take if you want to stay on that path and make sure you keep heading that right direction. And it's these three things. First of all, he says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Now, what does he mean by that? Don't be wise in your own eyes. Some of you, you know, you know things that others don't know and, and stuff like that. You might know more about it. I mean, I look at those that stand up here on the worship team and play their instruments and stuff like that. I, musically, I, I, yeah, I don't know notes don't understand, you know, music theory and any of that kind of stuff. Never have. Not saying that I never can. I've never studied on it. Many of you can address it and teach it and, and are much more wise and understanding when it comes to that whole musical aspect. Much more schooled. Some of you could actually stand up and teach on it and stuff. And there's areas of my life that's the same, that aspect that maybe I have and areas of your life. We all have those areas that maybe we know someone that we can do that. But God's saying, listen, don't ever think you're so wise that you know so much that you've got it all together that you never ever need to turn to God and ask ask his help. Don't ever think you have it all, know it all, understand it all. You may be good in what you're doing. You may know in what you're doing, but don't ever get so confident that you think you know it all and don't need God's help, God's leading, God's guiding, God's direction. Don't become so wise in your own eyes is simply what he's saying. Because when that happens, we'll come to that fork in the road and we decide with our wisdom and our hearts that can deceive us that we know because, well, hey, I've done this for 30 years. I know what's right. Well, but you could be on a happiness path. You could be seeking happiness at that particular moment. You need the wisdom of God to know why you need to go right instead of left. So don't be wise. And secondly, honor God's provision for you. Honor God's provision for you. Verse 9, he said, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Honor God's provision. You know, it's all God's anyway, is it not? And I don't think I, I really need to dress a whole lot about this. I think the scripture is pretty clear of what it's saying. I know people today get frustrated. You've hear, heard people say it before. They don't want to go. All the church does is want your money. All the church talks about is money, preaches on money, and all that other kind of stuff. Well, okay, it's not necessarily the church's fault. You can't blame the church over that aspect with it. God talks a lot about it. Here's one aspect. People get mad because, well, why should I tithe? Well, gosh, I don't know. God said it. I didn't put that in there. Don't be mad at me. Yes, man writ, wrote it, but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So if God's the one that stuck it in there, there's a reason. There's a reason that this all-knowing, all-powerful God understands why he asked us to do this, to bless, to give a part of your first fruits back to him. Because he knows the blessing, he, he doesn't need it, but he knows the blessing it brings to us. And what can happen when we believe, when we step out in faith, and when we do this, and we see that, hey, my God is providing all my needs according to his riches and glory. Wow, I can really trust God in this matter, in this fact, in this area. Wow, it's not me, it's not the church, this is... It's God. Enough said. <laughs> you know, and that when it comes to that. And the third thing he said was, don't blame God for your pain. This is a hard one. Don't blame God for the pain you're having in your life. He said in verse 11, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Sometimes, Sometimes we cause what's happening to us. And sometimes God knows that we just need some strong correction you know, in our lives. And he will allow things to happen. But don't blame God for our pain. I've heard people say, I know I have said when things have happened in my life, I've heard people say, well, why, why did God or why is God allowing this to happen to me? And usually at that point, I'm too much caught up in my own pain or my own self to really hear the truth at that moment. And the truth is, in most cases, God didn't allow that, to, or God didn't let that happen to me. God didn't want that to happen to me. Maybe even God tried to prevent that from happening to me, but God, because of my free will, God couldn't stop me. 
because I was trying to be wise in my own eyes. I was deciding that I was living on the happiness path instead of looking for, I was on a happiness quest instead of a truth quest. And God was making it clear that this is the way you need to go, not this way, but this is what I want. And so I listened to my heart and my heart lied to me and deceived me. And I justified why I needed to do this kind of thing. And I went down there and all of a sudden I ended up in pain and agony or for whatever it is. And, and you know, God's there the whole time through it. But, you know, it wasn't God that I need to blame for that aspect. We have a friend that several years ago, he lost his job and, and he had a very good paying job and his family was living very well. And he lost his job and he kind of went through this. And I would call and talk with him, you know, and, and once a week or every other week. And we'd talk about it, see how things are going, and we'd pray about it. And, and this is what he said to me in that a text that he actually he sent. He says, you know... We were doing so well in that. I mean, in that. But the problem is we were ignoring some of the most important priorities in life. Now, I'm so much more focused on my wife and my children. Yes, I'm working hard to get a job. But this time of unemployment has been so good for redirecting my values to where they should have been. Now, he wrote this to me. Those words, this time of unemployment has been so good. Their house was foreclosed and they lost their house. A nice house and stuff. They had cars and all this. And where they had to move and what they were situation they were... Actually, he moved back in at the age of 45. Him and his wife and, and, and two kids moved back in with his parents. From making all this money. And this is what he writes to me through that aspect. You know, he didn't blame God for the pain that he was in for what was happening within his life. He realized he chose a path that wasn't right. He listened to his heart that lied to him. He was seeking out after happiness and not the truth. And it led him to where he was. And then through this, through this discipline of a God who loves him and cares for him, who was there through the whole journey, he understood what really needed to be happening and life was changed. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves like a father does with a son he delights in. So my friends, don't be wise in your own eyes. You know, honor God's provision for you and don't blame God for your pain. Those are Solomon's suggestions. If you want to understand the path you need to be on, the direction you need to head in that path and how to stay on it, listen to some wisdom that, Sol that God gave Solomon that is there for us today to live our lives by in that. And those horses that Melinda and I took for a ride on our honeymoon, or maybe took us for a ride, depending on how you look at it, they didn't want to follow the path that had been chosen. They wanted their path. And I suspect that if we had let Rambo and Clyde choose their path, they would have headed in a direction and a speed that wasn't good for them, but even more importantly, wasn't good for us. And as the worship team gets ready to come back up here to continue to lead us to sing to a God that has a path for you, that loves you and cares for you, and has a direction for your life that's better than anything we could ever hope, ever imagine, ever dream, has things that he wants us to do and that, and as we continue to sing out to that, there is a path that God wants us to be on. And I want us to make sure, you know, that we're being honest with ourselves. I want us to make sure, you know, that we're not going the way we want to go, doing the things we want to do, but we're doing what God has asked of us to do. I guess I'm saying, let's make sure we're not Clydes and Rambos. Let's make sure we're actually listening and paying attention. And I don't know what that looks like. I asked you as you, those tough questions that were there, you know, to take a look in the path, if there's a path you're on today that you know you shouldn't be on and you wrong decision. I don't know how the Holy Spirit spoken to you and made that known, but we're going to spend some time in prayer and continue to ask God to, to bring that to us, to show that to us, you know, to make sure that we're on the proper path, you know, so we can understand that within our life. And after we're done praying, like I said, we're going to continue to worship God and give him glory and, and, and that through the songs and everything. But if there is prayer that you would like, if there's a decision you want to make, if you want the family of God praying for you, I'm going to be up front up here. Come on up. If not, if, if there's people you want to talk to afterwards about this and stuff, that's great. That's, that's what you heard me say. We're here to do life together, to try to understand how to make these. Don't, don't let it stop right there. When you walk out of here today, continue asking yourselves those questions. Continue evaluating and seeing this decision because those forks in the road are going to be there when you start walking out this door this afternoon, tomorrow, the next day, the next week, the next month. And God says, I want to be there. 
I want to be there. But are we trusting Him with all of our heart, leaning out on our own understanding? Let's go before Him right now. Father, thanks so much that we could be in Your presence. Father God, a real living real living God and Savior that is there with us and is there for us and that has blessed us in so many ways. I thank you that we could come into your presence and through the words of our song give you the praise and glory and honor you deserve, but also come and be reminded of your word, Father God, that is there. And, and, and Father, the blessings that you have for us and, and the life that you've created for us to live. And I pray, Father, as we just take this time, your word, Father, will just cut to our heart. And help us see, help us evaluate, help us ask those tough questions. Are we really going in the direction, living the life you want us? Are we on the path you want us to be on? If not, why not? And if not, how do we change uh, that direction right now? How do we become those prudent people that are willing to make that change no matter what? And not the simple people that are just going to go and pay the consequences, Father. May that wisdom fill us right now at this time, Father, and help us to understand decisions that need to be made, directions that need to be changed, then may you fill us, not just with your wisdom, but your strength to step and put those, put that all into emotion, Father. Oh Lord, again, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this celebration. I thank you for your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing.